My family's ancestry in Palestine goes to the 1500. Acres of acres of land. The French and the British agreed to annex al -Basra. The end of the Ottoman Empire. Well, the Balfour Declaration, 1918. Living through the British mandate. They start fighting between Arab and Jew. British soldiers were killed. Going from one occupier to the next to the next. My sister had Palestine on her um, birth certificate. I had Jordan on my birth certificate, and the American Jew had Israel. In 48, there was a lot of fighting around our house. My eldest sister was shot. A bullet come over our heads. By 6 o'clock, we have to go. And we just left. And they became a refugee. We lived in a refugee camp. Refugee status. Classified as refugees. They were refugees. Considered present absentees. They're Palestinians, refugees. In the 1890s, Millions of Jews fled anti-Semitism and persecution in Russia. They were encouraged by Zionist leaders to settle in Palestine, then mostly a provincial backwater of the Ottoman Empire. These 30,000 Russian Jews were the beginning of Zionist immigration, a movement that would change the face of the region, establishing a new nation for one people and sending another into exile. In 1915, battles began as the British fought the Turks for the region. In exchange for Arab support, the British promised to establish an independent Arab state. Two years later, British Zionists and politicians produced the Balfour Declaration, which promised the Jews a homeland in Palestine as well. Despite these agreements, at the end of the war, Britain and France divided the region and established Mandate Palestine under the control of the British Empire. Clashes continued between the British, the Arabs, and the Jews. Jewish immigration surged with the Nazi Holocaust. When the British ended the mandate, the United Nations partitioned Palestine into two states, Arab and Jewish. There was a civil war. The Zionists won, and the state of Israel was born. The British withdrew, and neighboring Arab countries invaded, but Israeli forces prevailed. Jordan occupied East Jerusalem and the West Bank, and Egypt took control of Gaza. More than 700,000 Palestinian refugees were forced to leave Israeli-controlled territory, never to return. My name is Alice Rothschild, and I was born in 1948 in Boston, interestingly enough, the same year that the State of Israel was founded. My parents were first-generation Americans and instilled in us the understanding that we Jews were a distinct and often endangered tribe. This Jewishness soon became grounded in our love of Israel. We were Americans, but we were also chosen people, and our responsibility was to kun olam, to heal the world. My mother, Sylvia Rothschild, was a writer, and she wrote books about the Jewish immigrant experience in America. I think her most important book was Voices from the Holocaust, which told the stories of Holocaust survivors who came to the United States. I learned from my mother that stories keep our history and our culture alive. I also came to understand that the victors in history are often the authors as well. As I moved into college and medical school in my young adulthood, my need to heal the world took the form of political activism. And my relationship to Israel began to unravel. I realized that I had never actually met an Arab before. And I had grown up with only one side of a very complex historical narrative. Starting in the 1990s, I began an active search for the voices that I had never heard meeting and listening to dissenting Israelis, Palestinians, other Arabs in the United States. And then in 2003, I realized I had to go there and see for myself. And I started co-organizing delegations to Israel, the West Bank, and Gaza, and meeting with Israelis and Palestinians in the region. I began to hear the enormous human commonalities between Arabs and Jews. And I also had to confront the trauma and the fear that pulses in my own Jewish DNA. 
Based on these experiences, I wrote a book, and then I began collecting stories of Palestinians who had come to the United States, much like my mother did 30 years ago with Jewish immigrants. I knew that May 14, 1948 was the glorious day that the State of Israel was founded. This was a victory over anti-Semitism and the Nazi Holocaust. For Palestinians, that day is called Al-Nakba, the catastrophe. The interviews with Palestinians that I will share with you in this film are the invisible voices that we have never heard. They are the other part of our story. That's my, the family of my great, uh, my grandparents, my mother's sisters, her own son. This is our house in Jerusalem, in Upper Bakha. This is my grandmother and my grandfather. They, live, and they still have that house in Jerusalem, in old Jerusalem, East Jerusalem. We lived a wonderful life as Palestinians. I had friends of Jewish faith and Muslim faith, had Greeks, Armenians. We are from Ramallah, uh, you know, and we could trace really our grandfathers with their names to, to the 1500. I was born in Haifa. I used to cross the Jordan River on horseback as a child. I, uh, my father would lift me up and I would pick grapes off the vine and oranges off the trees. It's about four bedrooms house and with the garden, I remember the flowers. Outside that house, it's beautiful. Oh, I love Java. And I'm born over there. I'm swimming like a fish and a water. We were wealthy. I mean, we had acres and acres of land. Grapes, uh, apples, plums, uh, cherries, mishmash, everything. Our roots from our family tree, I think, are uh, 1,090. 1,090. 1,000 years, 500 years. <laughs> <laughs> My grandfather had two homes. You know, he was a businessman, he had lots of operations, and he had a bunch of different corporations. He used to be the first authorized dealer for the oil company, PP. Our house many stories, uh, well, three and a half stories, that my father had started building in 1927. My father had a liquor store. <laughs> <laughs> City of Nablus is very conservative, and there were two liquor stores in town owned by two Christians. My mother tells us a lot of stories about growing up in the village, the difficulties, being a young woman, not entirely having a voice, at the same time being a very strong, woman, so a lot of her stories are about the times when she stood up. When I first started this exploration, I was really focused on 1967 and the 67 war when Israel occupied the West Bank and Gaza and East Jerusalem. But the more I listened to these stories, the more I realized I had to go back to 1948, when the State of Israel was founded. What happened to Jewish Israelis, but what happened to Palestinians as well? I learned from the Israeli historian Benny Morris that in 1947, Jews accounted for one-third of the population of historic Palestine, but they only owned 7% of the land. That year, with the UN partition plan, the Jews were given 55% of the land. The port of Haifa has been the scene of one of the many battles fought in Palestine, and evidence of the clash between Arabs and Jews for possession of this particular city underlines the bitterness of the struggle throughout the country. By the end of the 1948 war, Israel controlled 78% of the land. 750,000 Palestinians were dispossessed, 13,000 were killed. The Israeli forces destroyed over 500 villages, making it impossible for the Palestinians to return home. This made it possible, though, to have housing for the thousands of desperate Jewish immigrants that were coming to Israel at the time. What was the cost of those policies? In Detroit, with a group of other activists, I helped organize a public event where Palestinians who had survived the 1948 Nakba experience had an opportunity to tell their story. So, what's your name, where you were born? 
It was a bit like a personal truth and reconciliation moment where a Jewish woman asks a Palestinian what happened, what was the trauma, what were the experiences, and how did they survive and how did they make their lives afterwards? I was born in 1942 in Jerusalem. And uh, the midwife was my aunt. She went to Jerusalem municipality and registered me as Jirius Adib Khouri. The next day, somebody um, had an operation, military operation, and two British soldiers were killed. So they surrounded the whole area and they have dogs with them and uh, they prevented anybody from coming in or going out to certain area. My dad, he had a box with uh, some tobacco and lots of ammunition in it. So my ma was in bed and she said, well, bring that box, put it next to me and put a blanket on it and put the baby on it. She said, go through the magazines and find a picture of somebody British, anybody British, it doesn't matter whom and he found King George. <laughs> and they stuck it above my head, and a few minutes later, of course, they came in and they broke in the door. And they said, oh, new baby, what did you call him? And she said, what else? And I became George since. I am one of the eyewitnesses to the Nakba. Without uh, telling you my age, I was only 12 years old at the time, in 48. Um, I come from a village called al Kobab. It's one of those villages, the 400 and some, that in 1948 were totally demolished. I lived through the exodus from the village in late April, early May 1948. The village comprised about 3,000 inhabitants, uh, all farmland and orchards, situated on a gentle hill and the trucks used to come from Jaffa, loaded with oranges. And as they go through the village, they would be just barely crawling because of the weight of the oranges. And they were slow enough. You climb up, you, you hold your hand uh, on, on the uh, gate, and the other hand to take the orange, and that's all you can get is one orange, and that's it. In that year, in 1948, uh, we had a village uh, militia that bought their rifles from the British soldiers as they were leaving. This militia was formed by my eldest brother. I don't recall being scared at, at 12. You don't scare me. You're, you're excited. Uh, our house was a two-story house. Um, it didn't have glass windows. It had windows and, and the second story especially. And we used to stick our heads out and, and look when, to, to hear where the where the sound of the firing comes from, and we know where, where my brother is. I don't know how the word came to the village that we should be evacuated and move east out of the village to a safer ground. The first village we came to, and we were going to lay there until the 15th, because in the 15th, boy, the Palestinians will, will you go back to your, to, to your house and um, everything, everything's gonna be just fine. Because you, you know, the people don't, don't just lose everything they have. Somebody comes and takes it over. Well, we learned something that there was a, a different story uh, waiting, waiting for us to happen. My mother, who was a very strong person, could not take the thrust of what has happened to them. She was mentally not there. It went being quiet instead of the lively, steady person that she was before. And in 51, this was in 40, in 51, she died just while she was still in that state of not recognizing anything. So the Nakba meant losing your home, your country, your, your reference for, for the future. I was born in West Jerusalem in 1941. It happened when I'm younger, I remember it exactly. When in 1948, my father came home and he told my mother that there is a neighbor across the street from us was killed. And he said, by the evening, by six o'clock, we have to go.
So he get the whole family in the taxi. I remember running. I said, just can I take my doll? I love to take this little doll with me. And he said, just run and get it. And my mom, she has a baby 15 days old. So she grabbed her jewelry, wrap it in the receiving blanket of the baby, and she throws all in the car, and we left. So we went to Syria. And my father thought, we're coming back to our home and furniture and everything, so let's enjoy Syria. So he rented the house, and we lived in the house for a while. And things got worse. We, uh, my mom used all her jewelry for renting the homes or food and everything, and then the money is gone, and my father started finding jobs and no jobs. So things get worse. We stayed two years in misery in Syria, so we said we have to go back. Before we left, my mom did two things. One thing I didn't see, and one thing, she took my pants down and she put a belt on me, and she put safety pins in the belt. And later on, I knew it was money. She put money on every kid, with every kid. In case get lost, maybe that money will save him. My mom, she don't have a money. She left everything over there. My father, he said, just 15 days, you're coming back to the same place. Nothing since that day, 61 years ago, nobody back to Joppa. We went away for two weeks, we, were th we thought. We left the Christmas tree. My mother locked up all the drawers she could, everything, and we just left. Went to my aunt with nothing. No money to speak of, nothing. Two weeks. So many of these refugees thought they'd be home in two weeks. Now, when I grew up, I learned that Arab leaders told the local Arab population to leave. But in researching this history, using Jewish and Arab and international sources, I learned that as early as the 1890s, Theodore Herzl and other Zionist leaders believed that the local Arab population would have to be removed to make way for the Jewish immigrants coming to Palestine. I also learned that the Arab leadership actually told people to stay and to defend their homes. I learned that Palestinians did flee their communities when they were invaded or attacked, or when they heard about massacres, like the Der Yassin massacre. At the same time, the Arab leadership was arrogant and misleading and ill-prepared for war. Except for the Arab League, they had done no preparations. They were ill-trained, ill-equipped. They hadn't done any intelligence work. And they were facing a tenacious and well-prepared enemy. My father, who was very active against the British mandate, um, he was one of the few men in his village who actually carried arms and spent most of his time in Jerusalem and in Der Yassin. My father did not know how to deal with losing the country. He was in the front lines. So he decided to leave. I think he couldn't live in the country, having lost the majority of the land. For my father, in 48, the Israeli forces come in to the town. Um, and the town, everybody in the town decides to flee. They fled to the neighboring city, which was Nazareth. It's, uh, not even two miles away. Very quickly after Israel declared itself a, a state, they enacted legislation that said that if you even fled for a day, you were considered present absentees. They were present in the country, but they were absent from their parcel of land. So since 1948, they've been unable to get their land back. The state has denied all forms of compensation. And in addition, They've used this land to either house immigrants or to create factories or to create national parks, etc. And so the, the, the people who are actual citizens, as my parents are actual citizens, are unable to get any remedy or redress for land that was taken by the Israelis from them. As I interviewed Palestinians of different ages, I realized that the Nakba is not really over. I interviewed a woman named Hannah. She was born in Jaffa. 
She left as a young woman, she lost everything, and her family fled to Ramallah. And then I interviewed her daughter, Terry, who grew up in a fairly middle-class life in Ramallah until she experienced the 1967 war. The story of the Nakba was a story for my sisters and I uh, till 1967. It was my grandfather's story, it was my mother's story, it was a, a trauma. But, you know, when you're a child, you don't understand it. So in 1967, it stopped being a story. Israel struck Egypt, and it was war. So let's play you're 67, you're in Ramallah. I'm in Ramallah. You're how old? Uh, 10 years old. You're going to Catholic school. Catholic Life school. Is Life is wonderful. There's nothing wrong. And all of a sudden, I would call it the transformation from childhood to hell. Our house became a shelter because we have a basement. So we have 30 neighbors sitting in a small place, listening to a small transistor radio. No electricity whatsoever. Everybody gathered their food, but the, the grown-up basically knew that we need to ration. And after three or four days, the ration became, you know, less and less. But, you know, I'm 10 years old. Nothing bothered me in here except you're sitting there and say, you look at the fear. After the sixth day, you hear soldiers in Arabic saying, war is over, you could come out and you could have a white flag. You go out there and it was Israeli armies and soldiers that spoke Arabic. You see the panic on the family and you know it was not an Arab army. June 5th was the beginning of the war, and that was a Monday. Wednesday was the day that Nablus was taken. It was very scary, because they would come at night in the tanks and in the um, uh, jeeps and all of that, and sirens. It'll be like 2 in the morning, they will get the sirens going until about 5 in the morning, just around town, and then bullets. We had no shelters. There's nothing. And, and we had to find a place in the house that was the safest. So we sat all in one corridor. And then we had to have the lecture from my father about uh, what will happen if we separate, you know, because there was this fear about taking prisoners, raping women. But all of that dimmed compared to the idea of we are going to be kicked out. So go put whatever you need to take with you together because we're going to be kicked out. And I think that's the fear of the Palestinians. So I, I remember my father coming to us and basically handing us uh, the little money that we had and some jewelry. And we all agreed that if we separated and if we're kicked out, where we're going to meet. It's uh, Purim, 1965. And my father has a young little brother. And his brother was walking to school and was hit by a drunk driver and killed. The driver was Jewish. He was celebrating Purim. He'd been drinking a lot. He was never charged, not even with a minor traffic offense. And it sent my father into a tailspin because he realized that he was never going to be an equal in his homeland, and very quickly decided that he didn't want to live there anymore. And why was he never tried? That's just the way that the system was. And it, it, you know, Alice, it's, it's, it's no different today. Recently, just in 2012, a number of children were run over by Israeli settlers, and they don't get so much as a traffic violation. And so I think he chose Canada because Canada seemed safe. Israel was putting what they call lessons in the neighborhood. One time at four o'clock in the morning, soldiers came in and took two of my cousins at age 14 and 13, and they were dragged out of their house, and for three days they were never seen. They said they were beaten, they were harassed. They were asked the same question over and over and over again. No charges whatsoever, and then come back. Then there is curfews. 
your house is totally sealed. You can't go in, you can't go out. You are literally a prisoner in your own home. During a curfew in 1969, that's when they came in and broke into our house and beat my dad up in front of us. They start beating him with the butt of their guns and dragging him out. As they were dragging him out, we lived across from convent, Catholic convent. Sister Pia looked out of the window and checked, and she said, well, why, do, you know, why are you doing this to him? What harm did he do to you? And they shot at him. And they kept beating him up um, till a sergeant came in from where, and, and till today we say, bless that guy. And he told him to stop. What they were doing that day, they went from one house to another. And every male in that neighborhood, they beat. My mom and dad asked that we pray for these soldiers. They said, these are young kids. They don't know what they're doing. They're afraid. So why don't you pray for them? Israel did what it had learned in 1948. Go destroy the villages that you want to take, eliminate any possibility of life being there. And I think three, four days after that, we woke up and we found our backyard and the neighboring uh, yard full of people. Children and then donkeys and then babies and mothers and all of that. And I recall actually a woman gave birth to a child. They were all from the town of Qalqilya. Israel had moved there and they kicked the people out. And so they started moving them toward Nablus, which gave us the idea that next is going to be our turn. But there was a lot of commotion at the United Nations and then they allowed them to go back. And, and back, that's to back, back to Qalqilya and, and the neighboring villages. And that's when there was, we had a sense of, okay, perhaps the world is not gonna allow them to kick us out this time around. For centuries in Eastern Europe, Jews were victimized by anti-Semitism and pogroms, and this all culminated in the Nazi Holocaust. So for Jews, being victimized by an outside Christian culture, it's part of our core identity. We all feel like we all experienced the Holocaust and we all survived the Holocaust. For Palestinians, the Nakba, the dispossession and loss and trauma of 47, 48, is also a huge catastrophe. But for Palestinians, the problem is that this is never resolved. History has been continuous expelling and dispossession and living in refugee camps and the loss of land and lack of apology and compensation. For Palestinians, there has never been an opportunity to have closure on this trauma. The vast majority of the Palestinian 1948 fled their country or they, or they were forced. And my family was one of them. We thought it's a question of a few weeks. My parents took two suitcases with them and uh, they thought it's going to be a short time. That they never understood that it would be forever. They passed away in a refugee camp in Lebanon called the Baya Camp. For me, growing up in Jordan, I felt it's a country that rejected me, that didn't want me. Um, the Palestinian cause in the Jordanian curriculum, it's like two pages. We spent 15 minutes on it. My education about my history and, and, and what's happened to my people only came afterwards um, uh, when I came to this country. Well, Kuwait is a unique uh, itself because we were, we're I'm never, I was never a Kuwaiti citizen. I was always a Palestinian. As a Palestinian, you're limited, of course, to what you can or cannot do in Kuwait. For instance, once I finished high school, I knew that I couldn't go to the university. It was only for citizens. Because a lot of my friends and family and colleagues have immigrated to Canada. So we started going through the process. And August 2nd, 1990, we had an appointment to meet with the consulate in Kuwait. August 2nd, Saddam Hussein took over Kuwait. So we can go to the embassy. All I remember is I was arguing with my grandfather about I need to still go to the embassy because I have, I've been accepted already to university. And he's like, you can't go because the troops are already in. 
Well, about nine o'clock, the tanks were driving through the streets. So I know I wasn't, I wasn't going anywhere. We took all of our IDs and we actually dug a hole in the base of the house, put it underneath in case any of us lose control, then we could come back and at least know where to get our IDs. Because I think my grandfather said that's the first thing you want to make sure that it's protected, that you have an ID to do something. Up till then, they really didn't want to tell me anything about being Palestinian. His idea was just go to school and get a good college degree and just get moving. Don't worry about what happened to me, just worry about it's you. It's a burden. Yeah. yeah. He told us like how he lost one of his kids walking through the desert and then someone else walking behind him picked him up and found him later. I think it's too painful for him to sit there and just tell us. My parents were very worried about us. I mean, they've always been concerned about us. In fact, that's one of the reasons why we came to America, because my two brothers were roughed up. And my parents were family-focused. Um, they had their politics. They brought us with very strong sense of, of, of identity as Palestinian and as Arabs. We were all very politically active and very intellectual about things. After 67, my father wrote to his brother and said, I think the time has come. We got on a boat that was Greek American, and we were almost in steer. For a few days on the boat, nobody, none of the Greeks would speak to us. Nobody. Then one day, I came out of the room and I was wearing the Jerusalem cross, the Byzantine cross, and suddenly I was embraced by everybody and they thought we were Jews because we got on the boat from Haifa and they did not want to talk to us. When they knew that I, we were not, because of the cross, it was okay. And that was the first experience that I had from the other side. And then now I'm going, oh, wow, what it, fe what it feels like to be a Jew. I have had an acceptance from the University of Arizona to go to school there in Tucson. I remember leaving my youngest brother, Basil, with my grandparents and my brother, my mom and dad, and I got in the car and drove to Iraq. I think my parents were thinking, if we all dead, at least one person from the family is alive. I think that's yeah, their mentality because yeah. of what they've gone through. What I remember is just we went the next day to the embassy and they took my paperwork, I showed them the acceptance for the university, and they gave me a visa. So, you know, I said goodbyes and took some pictures and left. But it was the first time that I've ever left my parents um, for a long trip, uh, not knowing uh, when, to, when I'm coming back, but knowing that I will. Um, and just, you know, seeing my mom's face, I'll never forget. So, but I'm sorry about this. I didn't realize it's going to be this emotional for me. Um, I flew from Jordan to New York City. <laughs> and I arrived December, uh, no, October 31st, 1990. I did not know such a thing called Halloween night, but I learned real quickly. <laughs> I actually thought everybody dressed like that all the time. <laughs> and I'm like freaking out, of course, <laughs> thinking, wow, this is really weird. <laughs> and um, if I have to fit in, I probably have to look like this. <laughs> you know, my parents, um, their experience is obviously what they saw the Israelis do for new immigrants. They would provide housing, the bed sheets, the towels, pots and pans, a little bit, you know, a stipend. So my mother was expecting this welcome wagon when she arrived in Canada. She realized that there was no welcome wagon, which meant she had to get her own bed sheets and she had to buy her own towels and there were no pots and there were None of the things that, I mean, nobody told her that the way that you immigrate is you just go to another country and you're left with nothing. So did they find work or what they happened? They found work within uh, 24 hours. My mother worked in a factory, um, in a pillow making factory. My father worked as a welder. I had an incredible culture shock coming here. My father, although he's seen the world, he still was a village guy and he he still wanted to raise me as if we were in Betumar. So he would come to my basketball practices to make sure there were no boys. I was the only one who was not allowed to attend the graduation party because it was a mixed party. And, um, 
And then he sends me off to this unknown place. I was the only girl in, in a class of 40 of electrical engineers. And first year at U.S. University was a joke for me. I mean, I had already taken all these classes. I knew calculus, I knew chemistry, I knew biology. So I was not only the only girl, I was also the one who aced everything. And all these guys were knocking on my door for help and homework, to pick on me. I don't know. It was hell. So I came back after my first year of college, and my grandfather was visiting us in, Betum, in, in Amman, and I decided to go back with him, to cross the bridge with him. My grandparents' house in Betumar is on top of a little hill, and it's a beautiful house. It used to be heaven for us. But in terms of crossing the border, at the time it still wasn't easy. So you went through the whole cra crazy process, and including uh, they had you take off your shoes. But it's not take off your shoes, put them on a belt, and put them on. They took them somewhere to, um, to search them. And then, uh, and then there was a window where everybody would wait for their shoes. And they would dump all the shoes out of that window. And people would just attack because pe shoes get lost and they've been waiting for them. And that scene is, in my opinion, one of the most humiliating. And that year, both my grandfather and I were sitting on a chair waiting till people cleared and he only could find one of his shoes. So he, he was barefoot, going back to Betumar. The story is that they were in Colombia temporary, until things calmed down, or, and I, I think they believed that, you know, that um, 48 was a mistake, it was a crime against a whole nation, and somebody was gonna do something eventually. I think 67 for them was a, big blow to that dream. They were in Colombia when it happened. They had their Arab club. They would go to the club to learn the language, the music, the culture, the map. They had a huge map of the Arab world. Um, I didn't understand much, but I remember them telling us that we have, you know, piece of this land, like a part of the land was taken. In 73 was when they decided they needed to go back home. They start planning and then in 77, he died in Colombia. So my mom took us and left. She buried him in his village, in the piece of land where he always thought he was gonna build a house. When my mother came from Colombia to Palestine, they told her that uh, her application for um, residency, for family re reunification was rejected. And then at some point, they actually took her and threw her out of the country, put her in a cab and sent her to Jordan. So she came back and hired an Israeli lawyer, Felicia Langer, whose parents uh, were in Germany during the Second World War. And Felicia took the case to the Supreme Court and put a halt on that, on the deportation order. And she took us all to court with her. <laughs> and. Uh, I think the judges were not happy. And they asked her, did you need to bring? And she said, well, you know, out of respect, I left the two youngest outside. <laughs> I think she wanted them to see what 10 children means. They gave her a year. And during that year, Felicia organized um, a powerful campaign, both inside the country and abroad, which apparently worked. But then it would, it was gonna take 11 years until we actually got our IDs. We were on the boat for 15 days and landed in New York. And that's when I had a knot in my stomach because I remembered I don't like America because America had the Israelis and, and, and America's my enemy and America's after Vietnam and America's is doing all, all these things about American politics. And I suddenly uh, thought, what am I doing in America? For the longest time, I did not make friends. You know, I'm an Arab. You touch, you breathe on the person, and, 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 and your personal space is so close and so small. So I come here, and I'm talking with, with Americans here, and, and, and I'm so close, and they pull away. I touch them, and they don't like that. I breathe on them, and they're not too happy. And, and you know, initially, you would say, do I smell? And, and I know I brushed my teeth right. or whatever. And then I'll, finally, you don't want to be responsible for this, so it's blame. You don't understand it, so these people are cold. And I thought for a moment, ooh, wait a minute, stop. You can't do this thing. And, and I remember telling myself, America can live without you. You can't live without America. So what are you going to do with this? 
you ask me or you ask the interviewees as, where do you feel home? Huh. I feel that that is home, Ayn Karam is home. But as if there's no way of recapturing that. To me is Jerusalem, home is Jerusalem and Palestine. I love this country very much and I never deny the, everything we got from this country. Ten years ago I bought my first house. I always rented because in my mind I always felt like I'm going back. And this has been the first time that I feel like I belong here. The pleasant uh, side of my, my life uh, started when I got here. I have now, uh, I do have three, three children, five grandchildren. This is definitely my home. My heart is still where I was born, in Jerusalem, in Ramallah, in the old city. And I go through the town and I remember who lived there and who, who was next door and who was the next. And my tears run down. Oh, there's, I, I am totally homeless. When I go into our home in Jordan, I feel I'm safe. You know, this is my home. But being in the country of Jordan, they, they don't want us. One summer we were in Jordan and my son Giacomo, at the end of the summer, Giacomo felt anxious. And he kept telling me, I want to go home. I want to go home. And I realized that home is no longer what, what I define home. Home is where my child thinks of home. And where would you consider home to be? Jerusalem. For me, Jerusalem is not a political question, as in an ideological issue. For me, Jerusalem is home. And nobody can convince me that me being denied home is justified. Whether families stayed in the occupied territories or emigrated to other countries, they all speak of the centrality of Palestine in their lives, of a need to be seen and heard as fellow human beings, of a commitment to activism and resistance to longstanding injustices. Coming to Nazareth for the first time, at an age where I could understand, was really shocking. In 1987, it was the start of the first Palestinian Intifada, the first Palestinian uprising. I couldn't understand why young children were standing up to an army. Either they were incredibly brave, or there was a problem, and it ends up being a combination of the two. When you see, you just can't unsee. So even if I, if I wasn't able to understand the language, which I wasn't, there was enough that just didn't make sense to me. My grandmother was then the person who started telling me that we had been internally displaced. I had no idea. She told me that the house that she lived in, which was built in the 50s, was not her home, and that she had a home just a few kilometers away. Or that they lived under military rule. I mean, these were all of the stories that my father and my mother they just didn't tell me. It completely changed my life. I originally wanted to be a physician, decided that I wanted to be a lawyer, which I am. I really felt um, that something could be done for Palestinians. When I was in college, the first intifada broke out, and. Uh... Uh, 1987. And in February 88, a military order closed all educational institutions until further notice. The closure lasted for two years for schools, four years for universities. I became very active in what we called popular education. So every village, every neighborhood, every, you know, young people were called on to take the initiative. Um, in most of the places, women played an important role, although men were very active also. We didn't want to be stuck with generations of illiterate young kids. We didn't know how long that was going to last. And then it became fun. Then we realized we actually can teach Palestinian history. I became extremely active in articulating the Palestinian voice. 
I had been involved in giving presentations. I had to learn to dance so that we could go and dance Palestinian dances. I, had, I joined a group of uh, Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine. I remember getting engaged with universities that go from mm-hmm. campus to campus to speak, organize events, bring other people. My brothers were in and out of jail during the Intifada. My mother was running from prison to prison looking for her sons and her daughter. People saw the soldiers take my brother, but then we don't know where they took him. So then you go to the military headquarters and they say, no, he's not here. That we find out later was used as a tactic of intimidation for the prisoner, where the argument is nobody knows where you are. We can kill you, and by the time they find out you're dead, it will be long, you're long gone. And one of the tactics that a lot of mothers did was just sit in the headquarters and say, I'm not moving, shoot me. I don't go, I need to know where my kid is. Oslo is signed in 1993. It was very powerful to me because it, 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 to me, signified there was going to be reconciliation. And it was just a matter of time before Palestinians were free. So I lived in this kind of fantasy land for, uh, for a couple of years. Went back to Palestine in 1996, and that's when I began to realize that more checkpoints were going up and more settlements were going up. Palestinian towns and cities were now isolated and life has become impossible to do just basic things like go from uh, Janine in the north to Hebron in the south. Before Oslo, people from Gaza could travel into Tel Aviv, they would live in Tel Aviv, they would live in Nazareth, they would live all throughout the country and work there. After Oslo, you needed a series of permits. Alongside the permit regime came a very severe checkpoint regime. Day laborers would queue at about two or three o'clock in the morning. The checkpoint opened up at six, and it would take three to six hours to process all of Palestinian men. Many times they didn't get their pay. If there was closure, then they weren't picked up for the, the next day, which meant that they didn't get paid. But while Israel prides itself on these fantastic labor laws that it's got, these labor laws weren't, weren't applied to any of these Palestinians. In uh, the summer of 2000, I received a phone call saying, we'd like you to join the Israeli-Palestinian negotiations. I arrived the first day, the second intifada. I had hope at the beginning, but then once I was in the negotiations, and I realized just how arrogant the Israelis were, that this was really an issue of power. That's when I realized that this whole process was useless. Today, when you hear Israelis talk about they want a peace agreement, when you take away some of the layers and start asking them questions, you realize that what they want is a surrender agreement, not a peace agreement. They want Palestinian land without the Palestinians. I have established a program through the Ramallah Federation called Project Hope, where I take young kids age 17 to 25, and we go to Palestine and we do clean up, fix up, paint up. And one of the things that I do is take them to a refugee camp so they would know the difference between what their family is and what a refugee camp is. I take the kids through the checkpoints and I take them without a checkpoint. If we want to accomplish a goal, we'll go through the regular apartheid road. But if we want them to learn, we'll take them through the checkpoint. We were going on a trip and we took a Palestinian boy with us who have all his proper paper, everything. He's 18 years old, and he said that will be his first time going to Jericho. We got there to Ram, and you know, the soldiers were going to return the kid. I mean, he's in the middle of nowhere, no taxi, no nothing. So I asked the soldier, I said, tell me why. He said, well, this is not my rule. I said, well, go tell me who is going to, you know, who gives the rule. The fear in this kid's face, 
gave me determination that says, I don't care if I'm going to jail that day. So they called the captain. Respectfully, I was talking to him. I said, you tell me why this child, we have all his paper here, cannot go with us. And he said, I don't know, but you know, this is the rule. I said, well, no, either you explain the whole rule for me or I'm not going to just sit down. After 20 minutes, you know, I talked him into it. I shook his hand. You cannot go to the level of the occupier. You have to show that you are better than the occupier. Other, otherwise, this tragedy will become 100% worse than it is now. July of 2005, that's when the formalized boycott divestment sanctions movement begins. For such a young boycott movement, there have been a number of key successes. So I would encourage people to really push the boycott. Boycotting Israeli goods, boycotting the goods of those companies that do business with, uh, with Israel. I'd be pushing for pensions to divest from Israel. I would push for the United States not to give so much money to Israel. Three billion dollars every year is going to Israel. You're left wondering, well, why can't that money just be put to use at home? I, I always like telling the story of our little niece in the pool comes and tells her mother, this little boy has a gun. And the mother is probing and asking more questions. And then our niece, she was maybe three years old, says, no, I know he has a gun because he speaks Hebrew. How do you explain to a three-year-old that the connection they're making is not organic, it's not normal, it's not natural? How do you explain that? When was the first time you met a Jew who was not an Israeli? <laughs> She's gonna love this. Uh, 1997, uh, Harvard, Master's years. We're taking a course called Education for Social and Political Change. So this young woman approaches me and says, hi, my name is Rhonda. And I'm like, hi. And she says, I'm Jewish. And I said, and? Like, I, I, I didn't understand. So she said, I've never met a Palestinian. And um, we are now very good friends. <laughs> this has been 12 years ago. She invited me for Passover. And she said, what do you know about Passover? And I said, curfew. When they have Passover, they put us under curfew. That's all I know. And they have the chance to be in a place where Passover means a beautiful thing to somebody. It was powerful. My first year as a graduate student, I met Dorit. Dorit was an Israeli woman, Jewish. She lived in Jerusalem, so I asked her, did you ever meet an Arab? And she said, no, I never talked to Arabs. I never talked to Palestinians. You, other than a vendor that I would buy a kake, you know, like the Palestinian bagel from. So it was a long journey for us. And Dorit is now my best friend. Just like I learned nothing about the Palestinian cause, I learned nothing about the Holocaust. And, you know, Dorit started telling me things uh, because she has people that are Holocaust survivors, etc. But I refused. You know, for me, that's not my problem. You know, this has nothing to do with Palestine, and you cannot justify, you know, destruction of 500 villages. You know, that that was and still is my attitude. Then I sort of softened and realized that I needed to learn that history because, you know, whether I like it or not, it's become part of my history. With my friend, I've added another dimension of learning her experience as an American Jewish woman who is not directly tied to the Holocaust, but for whom this has shaped her understanding of herself, her past and her future. My voice over time started softening because I was beginning to realize that to be effective, you can't just attack people all the time. You can't always say, you know, I'm the victim, I'm the victim, I'm the victim. In the last five years, six years, being part of Zaytuna, which is the fourth dialogue group that I think that I've been part of, I would talk about the suffering of the Jews and I would talk about the Holocaust, but it was always with, but I didn't do that to you kind of thing. 
being part of Zaytuna and, and having to look inward, I realized that I was using it more as a strategy. If I show sympathy to your cause, you so show sympathy to mine. So that I needed to work on internalizing it enough to not understand it, but to get it. I'm definitely optimistic. And the reason is I just I feel that this can't go on for much longer. The boycott movement's picking up. People's eyes are beginning to open to what Israel's doing. So you think that things are going to change? They are changing. Snails pace, but they're changing. Just as Salma talked about realizing that the Holocaust had become part of her history, I've come to realize that the Nakba is part of mine. And now at a time when Israel has criminalized the teaching of Nakba history, we must learn, we must listen, and we must act. We must respect that Jews and Palestinians are equal human beings and that our futures are inextricably intertwined. Let us not be afraid. <laughs>